All right, so this is um, an accelerometer. I'm sorry for my voice. It's um, just getting over a bit of a Christmas cold. Um, this little chip right there is the same chip you'd find in an iPhone. And it's all about having a um, three-axis accelerometer measuring acceleration. And... Um, what my board does here, this is my little handiwork, uh, <clears throat> these things are designed to run on 3.3 volt power supplies and my Holly ECU is 5 volts and has 0 to 5 volt analog inputs that I can digitize and read acceleration data from so I'm really doing two things. One, this is set up to be plus minus 3 G's so a three and a half volt, a three point three volt supply divided by two is one point six five volts. So that's the sort of zero level of G's on each axis gives you three pins that are all one point six five volts, and then they swing between zero and three point three volts for the three G's. Well, it's just kind of useless for me because I want to be able to measure less than one and a half G's in all axes. So if you said that one point three G's would be a good maximum number for breaking and cornering and about 0.65 or 0.7 G's for acceleration then this scale is all wrong and it's providing very small range for the 0 to 5 volt analog input so I had to use a translation so there's three sets of quad op amps here good old-fashioned LM324's and um, what they do is they convert it so that I end up with uh, I have four, volt, four outputs instead of three I have one for each of the three axes uh, midpoint at two and a half volts, and I I get um, for each G I get a, a full volt positive and a full volt negative swing, um, and uh, so basically I can measure plus minus one and a half Gs instead of plus minus three Gs, but with much wider voltage swings, because um, these op amps don't go all the way to zero and they don't go all the way to five volts. They go the output, I should have picked different op amps, but these ones only go to uh, 0.6 volts in the bottom and 3.7 on the top, so that's my sort of swing. And then the fourth output is the acceleration only, and it's biased and set up so that I have um, basically a 2 volt swing just for 3 quarters of a G of positive acceleration. So I've, I've set an additional circuit up as a duplicate not for braking, not for cornering or anything else, just for acceleration. <coughs> Excuse me. And so it's very high resolution. So I can measure very precisely my acceleration. And yes, I will be putting the car in the next month or so on a chassis dynamometer. But this allows me to have my own dyno all the time so I can try different things and make adjustments in nitrous, adjustments in fuel. I can see how the car is doing with any minor change. Um, you know, chassis dynos are fine, but it's just a snapshot in time, and I'd like to have a continuous ability. And then this, because it'll be tied into the ECU, um, I'm recording this acceleration data at, in the same file at the same time as all my other engine parameters, which is also incredibly useful for diagnostics purposes. And Holly has a, what's called math channels on their diagnostics, so I can run any type of calculation on any input. I can do all, a, a lot of these, these are multi-turn potentiometers, so I can, with this group of them I set the um, offset voltage, and then with this group of them I set the gain. Um, so I've got a certain amount of calibration that I do just to hear in analog circuitry, and then the rest of the calibration I can, I can do whenever the fuck I want in the software. Um, building another little circuit here, I ran into an interesting conundrum. I have a lithium phosphate batteries, lithium iron phosphate batteries, with an internal battery management circuit that will go to sleep if you leave the car sitting there for two or three weeks. So the battery just shuts off. And when it shuts off, the only way to turn it back on is by um, either recharging it and establishing charging to it, or two, putting a six amp or greater load on for 10 or 20 seconds and then it'll turn back on. So I realized that with my wireless battery shut off circuit, what will happen is the battery goes to sleep, the shut off circuit then has no power to operate, so it won't turn back on, so I can't charge it uh, or discharge it to do anything. So I'm building a little circuit with um, 
some high wattage resistors and I'm just going to have a little switch I can flick with an LED that will just say okay let's pull 10 amps out of the battery it's a 10 amp load and basically nothing flows until it's, it senses that 10 amps uh, as, a, as a resistance value and then if it sees that resistance there for a long period of time it eventually turns on the battery again so this allows me to flick the switch and wait for the light to turn on then I know that the current's flowing and then I just turn the switch back off so this is a way for me to just go to the trunk if the battery's gone to sleep hit this button and then bang I'm back in business um, so this just solves this sort of a problem I created for myself and I got this nice um, cast aluminum o-ring sealed enclosure for my uh, three axis accelerometer circuit so I can finish this up and put a little uh, connector on it and then wire it into the ECU and um, I've already got the ability to do um, hardware uh, calibration with the potentiometers and then do some final detailed software calibration in the uh, sensor config uh, part of the uh, the Holly software so this is uh, going to go in basically at the same time as the um, evaporator unit. It's in the same general area. So what I've got here is a standard uh, lithium iron phosphate battery charger, 10 amp charger and um, there's my 20 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery and the way you're supposed to charge these things is um, it, it runs this thing at 10 amps until it hits around 14 volts and it starts backing off down to a trickle charge of 1 amp as it gets to 14 and a half volts and then it just sits there at 14 and a half volts um, and what I wanted this charger to do is get up to that 14 and a half volts and then immediately shut off so that it, the internal battery management system can do the individual cell balancing and then it brings it back to the nominal battery voltage of sort of say 13.4 volts when the battery's fully charged and it's sitting on its own. So what I wanted to do is two things. I wanted to have a charger, modified charger, that would um, go through and do the normal charge cycle up to 14.5 volts and then immediately shut off. Not let it sit there and float at 14.5 forever and eventually kill the battery because you don't want the battery voltage to stay high for long periods of time. Only only to get it to a point where it's you push the charge to 100%, you let it internally go through battery management balancing and then it'll, within a 20 minutes or so, it'll be back down in the mid-13s. Uh, and this charger will just hold it at 14.5, which is, you've got to be around to be able to say, yeah, it's finished charging, the light turns green, time to unplug it. I want unattended to go through its motion. So I, I have the ability to turn this on and there's two two circuits here. One is um, when the light is off, when this blue light is off, there's a blue light there. When that light is off, that means just hold the battery voltage between 13.5 and 13.8 volts, 13.4 to 13.8. And so I can just sort of flip this thing on and it'll just keep the battery in its normal fully charged state without overcharging it and leaving it floating at too high voltage and so it'll just put current in until it, it gets to the point where it's fully charged not fully charged but you know at its normal max voltage and then it'll go through uh, it'll disconnect and wait until it hits 13 and a half and come back up so that's the that's the first circuit design and it's running an Arduino processor to do this little, little Arduino like uh, processor so it'll go do that if I flick the switch the other way it'll let it go all the way up to 14 and a half volts and then it'll disconnect and won't reconnect until the battery voltage drops down to in the 12s so I can sort of set it and forget if I think the battery's been discharged for a long period of time or I've been fooling around I want to fully top it up I just put the put it in blue light mode and plug her in and let her go and it'll take up to 14 and a half and shut it off. If I'm sitting in the car and I'm working on the car and I want to keep um, keep current, you know, keep the battery at, at the right voltage, uh, but not constantly drive it too hard, I just leave it in this other mode. So that's my little circuit that uh, took me a little while to get fully programmed and working correctly. Now it's, uh, now it's awesome. 
so I'm, I'm really happy and I'm, that's going to be used quite a bit. Okay, so I got my little power resistor mounted. I hit the switch, the little LED turns on, you can see it, it pulls the current, or I shouldn't say it pulls the voltage down, but it, it, it will pull it down eventually. So yeah, that gives me, I think, 7 or 8 amps of load on the battery, and so it should be able to wake it up from sleep. It's on the other side of the uh, kill switch, so I don't, if the kill switch is dead and the battery is dead, I'll go in there and hit that button, it wakes the battery up and then the switch will work again and then I can get on my way. So I'm good, I'm happy now. Ah, so what have we got here? This is an evaporator that I've hacked off a piece of a Ford F-150 pickup truck uh, evaporator. So it's about three times as tall, I guess, in the F-150. And uh, it had aluminum pipes coming out of it, so I've just blocked off. I'm not finished building it yet, but I've blocked off the, uh, the passageway here with some uh, epoxy, uh, aluminum uh, uh, in, in reinforced epoxy, and then I'm going to just smooth this all out with some body filler, and then I'm going to actually rubber coat uh, the tops, bottoms, and the sides, and uh, there we go. I'm uh, going to be putting that in the vehicle. Uh, it tucks in on top of the computer area. It's just it's going to be way more efficient than the other uh, system that I had in there previously. So anyway, chipping away at it. Yeah, so this is how I'm fitting in the uh, new evaporator unit. It tucks in above the computer and steers clear of all the connectors underneath so I can still get access to them. And uh, then I've got a little cowling that I'm making out of uh, plastic that uh, will, like Sierra sucks in this way and then it goes around behind and gets pulled into um, the, uh, the scroll fan. So um, I have to fabricate that. But this looks like it's going to be really nice. So kind of a final look to it, nice and clean, it, uh, <coughs> it clears everything else, so it's perfectly fitting in there, so it's going to be good. Gonna be good. Uh, the other thing about brakes and such, so I keep on going back and forth on this, I may end up having to have the rear brakes down in the low 400 psi range, even with the new pads and even with everything dialed in. It may be that the car is so front end, you know, biased and the rears take no brakes at all. So I'm putting an extra small proportioning valve in line, an adjustable one in line with the rear line. Um, and I can leave it completely open so that it doesn't affect anything. But if I do need to go beyond, because the more I read about these Willwood proportioning valves is um, they can only go down so far. So it's about 50 some odd percent of max is how far they'll attenuate the rear pressure. And uh, so that just might, might turn out it's not quite enough. So rather than doing this several times and ripping out the master cylinder and then leaving the brakes and then finding out that I still need to put the other proportioning valve in, I want to have a little additional adjustment. So it's, gonna, it's a very small one that's going to tuck in from Speedway Motors that's going to tuck in just before the the, uh, the Y block that splits the line to the two rears and then I should be good to go. So a bunch of things all happening at once. Oh, so the axle drive shop shop has sent me my racing axles. So this is one of two. Comes with a new uh, front um, flange. So uh, and I got to go to uh, studs um, I gotta press them in. And uh, hang on, I'm just gonna set this down for a sec. So I can pull this flange off and take this nut off here. So, um, it's bulletproof. These things are way stronger than the um, stock axles are. And one of the reasons why I was getting rid of the stock axles wasn't because I needed stronger axles, it's because I had uh, play in the system. So I was unable so let me just yank this off. So one of the interesting things you can see right here is 
um, it's a it's a larger spline, um, so you have to have these aftermarket flanges, and um, so it's thinner here. Uh, the ID to OD is thinner, but um, this is a much stronger part here. So there's zero, like I can't, uh, there's no, when I when I do this, there's no, um, there's, there's no um, play at all, whereas my other axles have got a little bit of play in them, and so I get some slapping effect when I go on and off the throttle. So I was trying to cure that. But it's also nice just having, like, much stronger axles, so they're not cheap, they're $1,200 US, ha ha ha. But, um... Anyway, so what I'm going to have to do with this is uh, there's a tool to press it in, a bearing that you can just use the, a, a lug nut to um, cinch these things on. And I'm just going through the process of, of maybe, you know, probably going to do this, which is sw switch to um, um, the same design in the, in the back. So switch from from nuts to to bolts and um, on the flanges and uh, swap the whole car over and uh, so these are 12 millimeter by 1.5 thread uh, standard euro stuff and but they're it's a little longer stud sort of more of a racing style stud so I'm gonna go for longer nuts probably open-ended racing nuts so I'm trying to figure all that out right now and order all the stuff that I need so I will swap out, and I've got my new racing pads. I got my new Willwood um, E type pads. So the BP10s that are on there, the uh, I'm upgrading to the um, to the E's as my baseline pad, and then I can switch to the BP20s when uh, if I'm doing like full on heavy racing and they get hot. So anyway, pretty cool having this stuff around. I'm excited. Oh, and here's the other drive shaft shop um, racing um, axle, front axle, the long one. And uh, I was just comparing both the long and the short to the original 83 GTIs. Uh, I had an have another set in the car right now. These are the originals. Just double checking that I got the length right. I actually did an in-vehicle measurement rather than just take the stock length and duplicate it. Uh, just because there may be some subtle differences. You have a total of a 20 millimeter play where you adjust these things that on the inside will go plus minus 10 millimeters. So you want to be kind of in the center of the range. And um, with a car that with a lowered suspension, it has less movement up and down with stiffer springs and all that. Um, but still, I wanted to check it and everything, everything checked out, so I'm happy. So the reason why the car hasn't been out forever is because this is what my lane looks like. We're forecast to get another half a foot of snow tonight. Temperatures are just well below freezing so no way baby. This car is locked in the garage for at least a few more weeks. We're getting a long winter here in the Pacific Northwest.